Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you've followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello and welcome everyone to our podcast today. We're going to be delving into the intriguing world of grief recovery and human connection. In today's episodes, we're going to be exploring a fictional book called Making Up the Gods, which is our guest Marion Agnew's latest book, and I believe it was released later of, of last year. Making Up the Gods is a book about three grieving strangers, a widow, a young boy, and a middle-aged alcoholic. The book is set as a novel, as I've mentioned, in Northern Ontario. And it's going to be interesting to see how the author has woven into the guests their journey as each one navigated their grief. This is the first time we're actually delving into grief in a fictional way. And it'll be interesting to see how the author has navigated it. The novel examines the past that can keep us from living in the future, which we know only too well for many of those on our own grief journeys, how it's so easy to get caught up in the past. I'm interested to see how the twists and turns of this as they release their fears and hopefully teach us how we can release our own and move forward. So I'm delighted to be speaking to our guest, Marion Agnew, who's from Northern Ontario. And I'm quite envious as she has Lake Superior in her backyard. This is Marion's second book. Her first one was Reverberations, A Daughter's Meditation on Alzheimer's. Welcome, Marion, to the podcast today. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, thank you for joining me. Now, clearly, you're no stranger to the grieving journey. Obviously, there was the anticipatory grief you faced yourself as you went into your mother's own decline with, with the disease. It couldn't have been an easy journey for you, I'm certain. Well, I was young, and so I was um, part of, had some of that special snowflake um, energy that one has when one is young. I was in my 30s. My mother was 43 when I was born, so it, I was always going to be a little young to experience the death of a parent. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, everybody has that come at different times, and it's, you know, nobody wants it. Nobody welcomes it. But yeah. I felt very um, alone in that journey. Not, I mean... My siblings were also involved and my father was my mother's care partner, mm -hmm. but I, it, it was still one of those things, one of those experiences that you really have to do on your own and yeah. yet also in community, which is mm -hmm. a very strange feeling. Um, but it was such, it was like the first event that had happened that I felt compelled to write about. I was a technical writer at the time. And had, you know, loved books, all that, and was really mm -hmm. pleased that I'd been able to find a career where I could write. Um, but this was the first venture into what I think of as my writing, um, mm -hmm. creative nonfiction, uh, personal essays, and then eventually fiction. And at last, my novel so far, my first novel, I hope to say. Yeah, yeah. So it it sparked a lot, um, losing my mother. Um, knowing that my father uh, missed her more than I did helped some ruffle 
the ruffled feathers from the caretaking journey helped Mm -hmm. um, come together again because we both missed her so much. And um, so it was a a multi-stage process. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Was that partly why you chose to write a fictional book the second time around and exploring the grief from those perspectives? Well, funny story. Um, I was, I am so proud of the writing in my first, my first book. I, um, I, I worked hard to try to make dementia, um, accessible to people to have my emotions be something that other people could relate to. I tried Mm -hmm. to make it artistic. I examined sound throughout all of the essays and, and also I realized that it is not an easy book to read. Um, People often in the dementia process would prefer to have something inspirational or uplifting or positive. And here I am talking about how, you know, 10 years later, 20 years after my mother's death, I still think about her and Mm -hmm. maybe that's not what they want to (laughs) hear. So I was just pleased to be writing fiction. I knew I wanted to set it um, in Thunder Bay or just north of Thunder Bay where I live. I wanted the lake to play a role and this love of this place to play a role. And I really thought I was writing about people who make decisions at midlife and later, because that's always fascinated me. Mm-hmm. Um, I I knew people who got an opportunity to move across the country and chose not to go. And I'm I'm just fascinated by why would they choose that way? How did they make that decision to stay near family or to broaden their horizons? Were they held back or was it a real choice that to stay rooted in a place. So all of those questions I find really interesting. Um, And it wasn't until the blurbs started coming in for my book that I realized that I'd written about grief. Um, Because for Uh me, grief is is one of the primary motivators for change. Um, You know, pain or um, being sad that something's over, trying hard not to let go of something that you really, really want to hang on to. Yeah. Um, is it special own special kind of grief? And yeah, exactly. so that's where the, the grief came from. I was, I, I just thought everybody had, you know, when they lost somebody that they started making big changes too. I didn't know it was kind of my own thing, but um, it's turned out to be really funny. And I, I also didn't intend for it to, to be about a community's grief. Um, I just, I, in my novel is about these three people who come together, but in the background, before the the action of the novel starts, there's been a traffic accident in yeah. which a lot of people are killed. And so yeah. it's partly about how does a community deal with that? And there's been several examples since I started writing this novel of, of horrific traffic accidents where people die or um, communities are, are decimated. And, and it's, it's very sad. Um, yeah. And I didn't, I didn't intend to actually write about ways that communities could maintain healthy connections among people. And yet mm. there's that strand in there as well. So I don't know. I, th- I think writing is kind of a magical uh, thing that it's a way to address issues. And I don't always know, you know, I can't speak for all writers, Mm-hmm. I don't always know what I'm writing about until afterwards and someone reads it and tells me. Oh, is that right? So you don't consciously, uh, all right, these are what I am I explored with my previous book. I want to delve deeper into it, but I want to bring it from a lighter perspective by inventing these characters. So <laughs> no, it, I, I it's mean, almost, if- sorry. Oh, if anything, I would have said, I want to write it. I'm done writing about grief and pain and death. I want to write about something else. And so here come these characters and, and they're experiencing grief and pain and death. (laughs) And, and I didn't, I just kind of didn't realize it, but I, I mean, this book wouldn't let go of me. I've known the main character in the way not to sound like I need therapy, but I've known her for a really long time. And Mm. so I really wanted to do right by this story. And I, um, I'm just so grateful to have uh, brought the novel to a place where it can join the other stories of, of Northern and Northwestern Ontario. I was curious 
curious about that. Thank you for going into it because uh, you say you've known the character and it's almost like that character was alive in you and needed you to tell her story. Is that what I'm hearing? That's what it feels like. Yeah. Um, and even also, I mean, I'm also not a nine-year-old boy. I'm not a 69-year-old <laughs> widow. My <laughs> husband is alive and well. Um, I'm also not a middle-aged man. But at some point, the the people that you know, you you start to feel a responsibility to them because yes. they've entrusted you with their stories. Okay. Um, and sure, I'm also in control. I mean, I make it sound sort of woo-woo and magical, and it is a lot of hard work. Mm-hmm. So I knew that Simone, the the main character widow, was grieving her husband. I knew that Chen, the young boy who's visiting her, had lost his brother and stepbrother and his father in the accident. I knew yeah. that Martin had a, a more a private grief that he was trying to learn from and grow and, and find a new life. Yeah. I knew those things. And so I was trying to make those work together in this story, but I didn't set out to say, okay, well, I need, okay, what I need is a guy and what I need is a kid. Okay. I, it wasn't in um, that intentional. I've heard of that before though, Marion, where people have gone set off to write something totally different, but all of a sudden these characters are appearing and it's almost, I know it sounds woo woo, but I swear I channeled my book. I I don't recall sitting down consciously writing it. (laughs) It was as if it wrote itself. So there's something magical. I believe you're tapping into something. Mm-hmm. Um, There's a um, creative force of some kind. Yeah. Um, and it ten- sure. does tend to find me more often when I'm sitting at my desk ready to write than it does when I'm um, lounging around waiting for inspiration. But yeah. but it is there. And I, I think that trying to make sense of things, whether that's an intellectual sense or an emotional sense, or trying to f- even figure out how do I live now that this person is no longer in the world or no longer in my life. I think those are all really big catalysts for people exploring their creativity or Mm -hmm. um, challenging themselves in new ways. So I think a lot of people come to creative pursuits during times of of change and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Oh, I I couldn't agree more. I believe that any major challenge, i.e. a death or a divorce or something uh, that's taken our lives, disrupted it, is a catalyst for our own growth and our own uh, own change, if we're open to be exploring that. And I'll, I'll come back to the part, I believe you have it in your book, about where people can get stuck in, in the past. So I'm uh, we're coming mm-hmm. back to that, listeners. Stay with me. <laughs> As as I attempt to weave all these threads of this delightful story together. So it wasn't necessarily that you sat down and had these people. They emerged. What was it about the community connection? Because the story is set shortly after there's been this tragic accident and um, I think it was a tanker blew up and yeah. Simone was sitting there feeling very sad for this person that died alone. Mm-hmm. And that yeah. is a very true statement, isn't it, for people? That's their concern. Did they I, suffer? They died alone, eh? Mm-hmm. Especially like she had been so happily married and um, had lost her husband suddenly, and that had been almost five years before. And she doesn't have family, living family, and so her her path forward um, is is limited somewhat. And and mm-hmm. um, since she doesn't have um, her husband anymore, she the ch- chances of her dying alone have increased, and yeah. she felt so. Um, I mean, everybody in the town knew someone who had died, yes. but the driver of the tractor trailer rig that had 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 the accident and exploded 
was from somewhere else. And mm-hmm. so his family couldn't be here with him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, many of the other people who were, had died were also um, unable to be with family, but they were at least in their home, yeah. um, in their home community. And there, there's something about that feeling of, of being left a stranger and mm-hmm. no one knowing where you are or even who you are mm-hmm. um, that I think she felt very deeply. Mm-hmm. And that was probably um, that and the fact that she knew people who knew people who had died. I mean, that's the real beauty of a community like Thunder Bay, um, for better or worse. Everybody knows everybody. <laughs> Yes. So if you leave a, a community concert and you say to somebody on your way out, boy, that cello was flat. The cello player's aunt is right behind you and she's <laughs> going to get offended by that. I mean, it, it's ridiculous almost. Oh, that's my cousin. I actually went to coffee with a writer friend one time and she was talking about she'd lost her her um, great un- her great uncle. Yes. And mm-hmm. I happened to know him from being in the community. Oh um, it's, I, I had no idea he was related to her. Yeah. Um, and, and then my husband taught in the high schools. And so he taught maybe 3000 kids in his career mm-hmm. and each of them had at least two parents. And so, you know, the, the networks are just so um, persistent and pervasive. Mm-hmm. And yet there are people who come to town um, from, from Northern reserves um, for healthcare and for education or they're they're new to the to the country and come here. Uh, they come here mm-hmm. for education, and they are isolated. So it's it's that combination. It's a little bit of an alchemical reaction, where there's the closeness and also the foreignness that I think okay. um, uh, make for an interesting place to be and to write about. Yeah. What was the significance of the stones? I was curious there. Is she sitting at a table? Doesn't she pick one up? Well, and then, well, tell me, tell me that part <laughs> first, and I'll go on to the next. <laughs> well, um, I have. I this is something I took from me. Um, when you go down to the, it's a the beach at my family place is rocky. It's not sandy um mm-hmm. right up at the shoreline and so you i look for drift glass little pieces of glass that have made their way from somewhere else onto the shore and are all beautiful there's also a um, significant amount of pottery that uh we find washed up on the beach but also the rocks are just pretty um mm-hmm. they're pretty when they're underwater they look different when they're dry and so I'm forever walking around on the beach and I'll pick up a rock to look at it and then I'll stick it in my pocket. And I come back up to the house and um, put it into a bowl and it sits out somewhere. And periodically I'll walk past and pick one up and look at it. I mean, it's it's just a way of um, connecting. And okay. it, I started it actually when I before I lived here, I came up one summer and uh, the, we took a, a boat trip rented a motor for the rowboat and went out to a big island that's in the bay. And it's much more um, in the path of Lake Superior. And so the rocks on its beach are larger and they're also smooth. So there's mm. one that fits into the hollow of my hand. It's it's as big as a fist. And it's that pink granite that's just so beautiful. Mm. Yeah. And I took that home with me. I was living in Colorado at the time, took that home and it, it stayed on my desk. And so when I was feeling lonely or I wanted to feel connected to my life or the land here, I could pick up that rock and it just felt good. It felt like a nice mm-hmm. solid connection in my hand. And so that's a characteristic I gave to Simone. So, okay. um, and it's not necessarily, it's a, also a metaphor for holding on to things that maybe it's time to let go of. Yeah. And uh, I'm jumping ahead, mm-hmm. but, they do release the stones, don't they? What was the significance of that? Well, um, Chen, the nine-year-old boy, had remarked on it's weird to have a bunch of bowls of rocks around. And okay. Simone had said, well, you know, they're all pretty and they all like to be looked at. And and she said something of like, do you want to look at every rock in the world? And and so there was kind of a topic of conversation. And it had been something Chen had been puzzling over. He he even remarked on it to Martin, 
the stranger who was um, claiming to be Simone's cousin, he said, it's kind of weird. She's got all these rocks and bowls all over the place. And um, so for, they'd been skipping stones all week during the time that Chen was there. And so it was just something that she had thought to do with him on their last day, that it would be a a way for him to um, experience the joy of, of, you know, returning a a rock to the wild as it Mm. were. And I, I fully anticipate that they've both hauled rocks back on up to the house. I mean, it, it's not that they that is quit. It's just periodically you have to take them back down to the beach. And get rid of them. I wasn't too sure if they had perhaps put their grief and this was releasing their grief. That was what I took from that action. <laughs> well, that's certainly an option. I It's not something that I think they would do consciously, mm-hmm. but it is it is a, a sort of a sense of an ending. It's yeah. a, a ceremony. Actually, speaking of ceremony, when my husband and I got married, we got married on the, the beach at our camp. And part of our um, ceremony was throwing rocks in the water because they ripple. And, mm. and so... You know, it, it's a symbol of the ripples of love or the the time passing, and um, so it's a it's very can be a very important part of any kind of ceremony. Yeah, um, I noticed that you had a, a guest recently talking about ritual and ceremony after after um, deaths and and big changes. And mm-hmm. I th- I think um, I mean when my mother passed, I was really wishing that we lived in the Victorian era because I wanted to wear black and a veil and I wanted everybody to know just how sad I was. And, you know, it's so easy when the culture has one form of way of of communicating what someone's going through. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That is so intriguing, Marion, that you should mention that because after my dad died, I was looking to the Victorian era because they had books on etiquette. They had books on everything to see how I could navigate my grief at that particular time. So it's interesting that you uh, would refer back to the Victorian age, the the black. And yeah, it, it just sort of allowed you to stand out and people knew that you were mourning, whereas now nobody knows and you almost have to put on your happy face wherever you go because you don't want to bring people down so I I, yeah I I kind of like those black uh, the idea of it for sure Mm -hmm. and all the rules you know after a year you could wear purple Um, and I mean in a way that kind of helps usher the person who's grieving through the process also Oh, yeah. okay. I'm in purple now. Maybe I could go to lavender and um, kind of maybe put that aside. I'm ready to not wear that anymore. Those yeah. are steps along what is often a chaotic journey, if if you want to use that metaphor. It, yeah. There are things that you can do, concrete things you can do during a difficult time. Absolutely. And um, how did your characters navigate not getting stuck in the past? Because I think that was, to me, that was a poignant part of the of the book that they did, they were able to move on. Can you address that? Sure. Um, well, Simone was pretty stuck. I would say she yeah. has uh, conjured the um, the ghost, for a better word, of her husband, her late husband. Okay. Um, when he died, she. Um, decided that she was going to stay in Northwestern Ontario in spite of not having grown up there. And, but at the end of it, the first year, you know, everybody hears, you make it through the first year and all those anniversaries. And then, and, and then what is your, he is still gone and you still have to continue on. And she was just kind of not having it. And so she stood at the window one night and, and his, his presence came back to her. And about the same time, she noticed two other um, relatives who had passed on, who has, had also come back. One was her grandfather, who she had spent time with as a young girl, who at this camp, this family place, but she had, hadn't seen him since she was a very little child, mm. but who re- represented to her the love of of living where she lived and and being there with this family responsibility. And then the other was her mother, who... Mm. Um, 
you know, it's one of those uh, questions I have. Simone remembers her mother as being an absolute terror of a mother. And yeah. she certainly seems like she had, um, like she went by Carmen. She changed her name. She has a flair for the dramatic. She's always complaining that Simone isn't isn't um, smart enough or she's not outgoing enough or she's you know, not doing it right. Um, and that sense of, of, I can't measure up um, mm -hmm. would have been a very old, old tape for Simone. And yeah, okay. how accurate a picture of her mother that was for, is anybody's guess. Mm -hmm. But for her, it was a story that was holding on and holding her back. Like, you don't know how to make friends. You don't know how to mm -hmm. be in a community with other people. Um, you don't deserve to have family. Those are the the tapes and the messages she would hear from this ghost of her mother. And okay. I think she might have wanted to be part of a community. I know she enjoyed mm -hmm. Um, going to um, meetings at the church and those church type friends, but yes. she was unwilling to take the next step that would have meant risk um. until um, then Martin showed up at her door and he said he was her cousin. And she said, you can't be, I don't have any cousins. And he said, mm -hmm. on your father's side. And she thought I, that's possible. Mm -hmm. And then the thought of having actual family um, was so appealing, surprised her, but was appealing to her. Okay. And so that was another little step toward maybe I do want connection. Mm. And then um, agreeing to keep this young boy who's nine, whom she she's kind of chatted with him at church a couple of times, but doesn't yeah. really know him keeping him for a long weekend and then eventually, you know, spoiler alert for 10 days um, <laughs> that, and, and making herself open to him and, and listening to his um, some of his stories or his mm -hmm. questions about the world. And um, I mean, early on, he talks about um, the role of trickster gods. He has okay. an indigenous friend. And so he's been reading up about indigenous traditions and trickster gods. And he said, why, if you're making up gods, why would you make up one that is mean and, and does things you don't understand? Okay. Um, why wouldn't you make up a God that, that is everything good and happy all the time. And that really, um, those questions I find I, from my experience with my nieces and nephews, mm -hmm. um, seem to come out sideways you know, the big questions about, well, why did this have to happen to me, to my stepbrother, yes. to my father? Yeah. Um, and so, and, and it's only been three months since the accident happened. And so Chen is sort of in triage. I mean, it was completely mm -hmm. unexpected. His mother is struggling a little bit. So they told him not to think about the fact that he feels responsible for his brother and stepbrother and dad being there. And so he takes that literally, like, I cannot talk about this anymore. Okay. And eventually he confides in Simone. And mm. then Martin has a whole, he's, his, uh, his loss is a little bit farther in the past, but he has a, a different set of choices to make too about, because he's a recovering alcoholic and it's not yeah. like it's one and done. That's a, a daily choice and a, a daily decision that you make and how you behave in community and what is constitutes a lie and how are you, um, truthful with yourself. All of those questions are are part of letting go of an old life mm -hmm. and stepping into a new life and keeping on the path that makes you healthy. Um, and so they just had all very different little journeys to make. So I that kept me really interested and and frustrated, but really interested <laughs> in the process of writing. Yeah. yeah. So Simone was looking for connection. She found it in Martin. Mm -hmm. won't, won't go into the spoiler alert of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's an intriguing tale unto itself, isn't it? But how she befriends the young boy and supports him through his own grief. The choice of having somebody that ha has a an alcoholic past. He sounds like he's been in and out of recovery a lot. What were you wanting to explore there? 
the grief and the pain, the the reason why perhaps somebody turns to alcohol? Well, for me, it's more the sense of um, it's well, it's like I said, it's not the one choice that you make and then everything is all great. Mm-hmm. It's it's always um I mean, I'm not an expert in in addiction. I am not an alcoholic. I don't practice a 12-step program currently. Mm-hmm. I was a, a 20-something in the 80s. And so I was part of the whole, you know, codependent no more, adult children, 12-step okay. groups. Um, I was having a little bit of a delayed adolescence. And so I needed to learn about some of the very basic concepts of boundaries where I stop and someone else begins and choices. Mm-hmm. And what is my under something I can control and what isn't, you know, that basic serenity prayer. Um, And I think, I just think it's so useful. Um, It's a useful rubric um, for making choices. And Mm -hmm. so Martin has done a really great job. Like he's been sober for some time at this point and it's, and yet each new loss or choice that he makes presents the same choice. Is he going to make the choice of basically lying to himself and about himself, Mm -hmm. or is he going to tell the truth? And um, for this, this particular instance, we know early on that he's, um, he's pretending to be her cousin and, and it's in service of a greater change that he wants to make. He wants to get better work and do something that's more interesting than the kind of fly-by-night jobs he's had and you know there's a different economy now he might might have made a different choice now Mm -hmm. um but still the aa family or the 12-step groups um there's small towns have 12-step groups in them um little churches everywhere have a second congregation in the basement on you know from seven to nine o'clock on saturday night Mm -hmm. or whatever time the meeting is And so it's a kind of an instant community and it's also, uh, you have to, you have to go, you have to keep coming back Mm -hmm. um, and keep practicing the, the kinds of choices and actions that you know are good for you, even if there may be not what you want to do at that given time. So I saw um, Martin as being a little bit farther. I mean, he has had a loss recently, but he's, he's a little bit more stable even mm-hmm. certainly than Chen. Chen's loss is so immediate and so yeah. real to him. Yeah. Um, but Martin's older and he's, he still has to make choices. And is it, is it possible to change your life when you're 50, 55? Um, and I mean, I, I believe very strongly the answer is yes, but it comes mm-hmm. at a cost. Yeah. Yeah. And for somebody who has struggled with alcoholism for so long, and as you mentioned, this community in the 12 step program, if you say, well, I'm okay, then an attempt to go alone, you've lost instant community, haven't you? Yes. So here they are, the three of them together. What was going through your mind? When you did you switch the story around in Martin's character, or had you that idea that it was going to turn out that way? Um, Martin has was the most difficult character for me to get a grip on. Mm. At first, I I wanted him to be rougher, um, okay, and more um, likely to be. Uh, taking advantage of Simone on mm-hmm. his own, trying to figure out a way to take advantage of, of both this person who is paying him to come up and pretend to be her cousin and Simone herself. Um, maybe he, at one point in an early draft, he even thought about kidnapping Chen. Maybe there was a way he could extort money from her mother, from his mother. And, and it just didn't ring true. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think that people are, are born evil. And mm-hmm. I, I think people, um, have experiences that are for better or worse, make them behave in, in certain ways. And um, I I didn't know enough about the kind of choices that would make a person have those thoughts or see those as actual possibilities. Okay. So um, it took a while. 
but finding out that Martin could just be a, a genial kind of a doofus. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, I love the guy. Um, yeah, he's yeah. really great. Um, but he himself says, you know, people are so hard to deal with. I want to just go back to planting things. Um, and he, he, when I found that a, a way for him to have loved the out of doors, he worked in a nursery, he worked, um, mm. picking, um, fruit and vegetables in Southern Ontario. And that gave me a way for him to connect with Simone. It gave okay. him an expertise also mm. and an yeah. interest of his own beyond staying clean or beyond trying to get out of debt and trying to stay away from casinos and figuring out life. Mm. Um, he really liked being outside and, and doing handyman kind of stuff. And that gave, that was just um, a fortuitous, it's not accident, but it was a, a fortuitous choice on my part for a while. And then of yeah. course I, I thought, Oh, this is perfect. This is, mm -hmm. This was not something that I invented. It was something that seemed to to come naturally, grow naturally yeah. from the garden of this story, yeah. to use a whole different metaphor. Um, and oh. but Martin really um the the idea that people can have a conversation and hear something incorrectly mm -hmm. um or misinterpret something that is said in a conversation came to me very late in the process. Okay. And um it's partly my own tendency um, writing fiction I'm still relatively new at it in spite of working for 15 years on it um, <laughs> but I like to get people into a room and put them around the table and have everybody say exactly what they want and need mm. and that doesn't make for a good story <laughs> and, you know it's not real life either yes and yes sometimes I just feel like it's amazing that any communication ever happens at all Mm. Um, because people are such at cross purposes and they, they hear so many different things depending on their own experiences. Yeah. And so when Martin really misheard something that this man he was working for, um, there was a, just a huge misunderstanding there that felt, um, that it was the right way for his character okay. to behave as well was because mm -hmm. he doesn't really do really well with people. So anyway, it, it's been a journey with with Martin. It, yeah, for sure. So it sounds like they found each other at a very timely moment and the three of them helped each other through their challenges. Yes, that's true. I mean, it, it was fortuitous timing. Um, yeah. But I also think that when when you're ready, things start to happen for you. Um, yeah. What is it? Is it Goethe that said, if you, uh, whatever you're doing, commit yourself to it because the commitment has a, a kind of an energy, I'm paraphrasing, but it has its own kind of energy. And so yeah. for Simone to say, I think I'm ready to maybe be part, more part of a community and then have this opportunity given to her to keep Chen and then mm -hmm. have Martin appearing at her door um, those are opportunities and also tests. Was she really ready? Yes. Yeah. Cause she could have just slammed the door on Martin and then that would never have happened. I, yeah. And you wouldn't have had a book. Would not have had a book. <laughs> nope. Interesting. What was the, the actual title making up the gods? Is that to do with Chen's story? Where yes. did that come from? Yeah. Yeah, it's that very first conversation that Chen and Simone have. And it's actually the first scene I ever understood was in this novel. Um, okay. It's Simone. So Chen's mother has dropped him off with Simone to stay for a long weekend. And they go down to Lake Superior shoreline. And it's May and it's chilly. But they're mm -hmm. standing there waiting because how can you kind of not walk out into the water if it's a sunny day? Yeah. And, and Chen is just talking about something that's on his mind, which is um, trickster gods and, um, okay. and how indigenous traditions usually have a trickster God and what does that mean? And mm -hmm. so it's that, but for me, it also means um, making up the gods is a way of saying what, to whom are you giving your power? Uh, what power okay. are you giving away? Like mm -hmm. Simone's mother Carmen doesn't necessarily, shouldn't necessarily have that kind of power over her anymore. Doesn't have yeah. to. Yeah. 
Simone yeah. could move beyond that, but mm-hmm. she's sort of given it away to, to her. And the same is a little bit true of, of any person um, going through a, a growth journey. What, what stories yeah. are we telling ourselves about ourselves? And is it time to let go? Yeah. Um, is maybe it is time to step into a role. Maybe Martin, um, if he finds a home in the AA groups in Thunder Bay, maybe he'll be a sponsor for someone else now. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe it's time for him to step into some of his knowledge. Yeah. Um, So I, I just think it's one of those questions that we can all benefit from asking ourselves from time to time are yeah. the limitations I'm putting on myself. Are they helpful or are they actually preventing me from growing? Mm. And it's, there's no right answers. There's just choices and it's a difficult balance. Yeah. It's just asking them, isn't it? Mm-hmm. What um, challenges or joys did you get when you were going through it? What was your greatest challenge? Um, well, plot is always difficult for me. I'd love to describe things. Um, I love to have people just natter away. And so making sure that they were nattering away about something that led the story forward was mm-hmm. always a challenge. Um, but also there, there's a lot of challenges, I think, in being any kind of a, a creative person. Uh, the, the, um, ego it takes to to feel that you have something to say and I think a little humility is always helpful but you have to start with some sort of confidence that even if you never show it to anybody that what you're doing is worthwhile for yourself yeah you know for for my own journey um I I think I pushed myself to be um emotionally present to different kinds Mm. of people Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was something that I had learned during it. Um, and I mean, the whole thing has been a joy, uh, the whole process of, of having the experience of learning to get to know people that I don't know, haven't known before, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um, the degree to which their stories are real, how much control I have over how I tell the story or who the character is, has always been kind of an interesting yeah. puzzle to me. Yeah. Um, and, and then it's been so wonderful. I really appreciate the support of uh, the Ontario Arts Council for funding um, for me to work on this project. I mean, it's the nuts and bolts of, of being a, a creative person in today's world. Mm-hmm. Um, they also support small publishers, um, okay. independent publishers in Ontario. And that's one of the publishers that um, chose this book, uh, Latitude 46 in Sudbury. They specialize okay. in stories of Northern Ontario. Mm. Um, you know, there's lots of stories, people set in Toronto or in some of the urban areas or yes. suburban areas. And those are yeah. great stories. I'm not saying that those shouldn't be on the shelf, but I like to see other kinds of stories out there too. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the things that uh, resonated with me when I was reading the information that the publisher had sent, that it was set in northern Ontario. Um, Yeah, that was beautiful. So that was one of the joys as you got to explore. Did it help you understand your own grief a little bit more going through it, Marianne? Yeah, it does. Um... I I do. I am married. I, I might be a widow someday. Um, mm-hmm. And so I had a little bit of that. I wanted to do right by that experience of widowhood. Um, fortunately, or unfortunately, my husband was a, was widowed before I met him. And so okay. he, um, his experience has helped inform that. Mm-hmm. But also, I do think that writers rehearse, we get to live a million lives because we create these characters who have all these experiences. And I think the same is true of readers. I mean, Mm -hmm. how many people going through a breakup read about someone who's going through a breakup? I mean, Bridget Jones, her, her diaries are so popular because people (laughs) can relate to that so much. And you, you get to experience someone else through reading. So by reading and writing, I think, um, I've, it's a challenge 
to um, become more empathetic, mm -hmm. um, to imagine how difficult something must be. Um, and in, in the process of writing, I was fortunate to work uh, with a group at uh, Sage Hill Writing Experience in Saskatchewan. So a small group, we were sharing stories about mm. our works in progress. And yeah. one of the people there said to me about Chen, oh, he must have been so mad about being left behind and didn't get to go on the cruise with his mom. And I thought, oh, wow, he would have been really mad. And I hadn't thought of that, but that was her first response. Yes. And it it felt right to me. And yeah. so that process of of weaving other people's responses into mm. what a character might or might not be feeling was yeah. was also really fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's always a little bit of a rehearsal for life, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, a way to say for myself. The, the thing about what stories am I telling and what am I ready to let go of and how can I move forward? I think that's going to stay with me always. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I had done it before. I know that when I had written about my mother and completed my first book and, and felt that those stories were contained a little bit mm -hmm. um, on, on paper and between the covers of a book that I had somehow finished a part of the process of active grief for my mom and dad and, and was mm -hmm. ready to step into a new. So, you know, that's when I started working more on fiction and step yeah. into this new sort of world. Um, not, you know, not leaving it behind in any way, but no integrating it in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Into it and bringing it up to a new level mm. for sure. What do you want the reader to take away? It's a delightful book. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I would like, if a reader is entertained for a few hours, I think that's great. If they yeah. want to go learn to skip rocks or take a kid out to lunch and see what they're thinking about, that could happen. <laughs> um, and and also just, I, I think Simone is, uh, she's at the cusp of a new time in her life as well. Yeah. Um, she's approaching 69, 70 years old. And mm -hmm. as we get older, um, there's a lot of choices that we have to make and we have a lot of loss in front of us, like it yeah. or not, you know, at yeah. some point she's not going to be able to mow the lawn. Mm -hmm. Um, at some point she really is, is going to need help. Um, yeah. I know people who have recently moved into assisted living and mm -hmm. it's one of the benefits is that they never have to think about making dinner again, yeah. but then again, they always have to eat what the cafeteria makes. So exactly. it's that mixed blessing. Yeah. Um, and so if, if just to recognize that all of life is a challenge and mm -hmm. um, there's many opportunities for growth along the way. Yeah. I think that'd be great. Lots and also of opportunities for uh, gifts and yeah, it depends on your choice at the time, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's never too late to, to try something new. No. Or to take a, a different approach. Um, and and if people want to come and see Lake Superior, that'd be great. Oh, because I, I recommend think... it. A beautiful <laughs> part of Ontario for sure. I do Marianne... try to I do try to be aware that I'm a Lake Superior person and not everybody <laughs> is. Some people have the same feelings about mountains, and I will allow them to feel that way. But yes, but they Superior. have to at least take a peek at it, it to imagine the rugged beauty of it that it affords yes. for sure Marion what a delightful conversation thank you yeah. so very much for jumping on the podcast oh, well, and connecting with me it's been really wonderful and I appreciate it so much you're so welcome and if we just um it's a publisher here in Ontario but I'm imagining it's readily available in bookstores is. is it it is um, in Canada and the U.S. And okay. um, walk into your local independent bookstore and ask them to order it for you. And um, that would that's that's great. If you want to yes. order from one of the big places, that's fine too. Or you can order directly from the publisher. Yeah. Latitude forty six. Okay. But yes, it's available. And you have a website that people can connect with you, can they? I do. It's marianagnew.com and also .ca should be the same place yeah and if you have any social media 
um, and connections. We'll make sure we put all those in the show notes so people can connect that way. Oh, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining me. This is Anne signing off. Bye-bye for now. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>